This afternoon, I was once again at Tamworth Castle, as we uh, had a few more performances, especially of things which were not done before. And uh, I hope you enjoy it, and hope you have a nice time. Do not worry, I won't be reprising. I won't be reprising anything, and. Uh, I will see you for the summing up at the end. Have you ever been brushed, seen or been brushed by a ghost? Or haunted by a spirit who has lived on past the death of a tortured soul? Have you been spooked by a spectre in a chilly, dark churchyard? Or heard the moans of the ghouls trapped in the tombs below? Have you ever seen a wraith appear on a lofty staircase or been lost in the fog as a phantom passed by? Do not be afraid. They are just apparitions creeping out of the shadows of your mind. Bewitched. It was the morning after Halloween. <coughs> I put on my coat and went for a walk in the woods. Birds warned each other of my presence. The only other sound came from the dead leaves scrunching beneath my feet. There was a faint smell of smoke, but I was unable to find any evidence of a smouldering fire or spent fireworks. Everywhere was calm, <clears throat> but I felt uneasy. I had the feeling I was being watched. As I walked back towards home, I heard a rustling behind me. I turned quickly. Nothing. I walked on, my antenna on full alert. I spun round again. Was that a shadow? Or was it my imagination? There it was again, darting behind a tree. I nervously approached the tree. Nothing. I picked up a stick and held it like a weapon. I called, come out, show yourself. No response. Had I imagined it, perhaps I'd imagined the whole thing. I hurried home. As I turned the key in the door, I heard a meow behind me and saw a beautiful black cat. Where have you come from? Was that you following me? You scared me. I picked her up, but she wriggled free. From that day, she never left my side. I named her Shadow. She was a strange cat. She refused to eat cat food, preferring to eat the same food as me. She loved McDonald's and chocolate cake. When I watched the television, she sat upright next to me. I never saw her curl up like cats do. Every night, she would sit at the window and watch the sky. In the morning, she would sleep on my bed. The following Halloween, Shadow became agitated and stalked up and down, meowing loudly by the front door. What's wrong? Don't you like Halloween either? I tried to stroke her, but she arched her back and hissed at me. I put a piece of chocolate cake on her plate. That should do the trick, I thought. But she started yowling and hissing. You can't go outside, it's dark. You'll get lost, I said. Perhaps my anxiety was rubbing enough on her. Nevertheless, I went through my usual Halloween routine. I turned on the lights, closed the curtains, turned up the volume on the radio, unbolted the doors. We were safe. I panicked. She'd gone. Where are you? I called. I looked in all her favourite places, on the bed, under it, on the settee, under the radiator. My legs went like jelly. The cat flap. I pulled on my boots and grabbed my coat. The night was eerily calm. The waning moon cast a silver glow. The silence was deafening. I called Shadow, where are you? I heard meowing coming from above me. I looked up and saw a broomstick gliding silently in the sky, steered by a hunched-up witch wearing a large hat. 
riding pillion, was shadow. She waved at me as I stood rooted to the spot. I quickly recovered a man, following them towards the woods. Sparks flew as the broomstick started to descend. There was that strange smell again. I pulled my coat over my nose, but my eyes were stinging. Then I saw them dancing around a cauldron which was hanging over a bonfire. It had blue-green sparks coming from it. The witch dismounted her broomstick and joined the other four. They surrounded Shadow as they danced and chanted. It sounded like an ancient language. I was mesmerised. Their chanting got faster and I could feel myself getting light-headed as I swayed to their rhythmical voices. They pointed their fingers uh, they pointed their fingers with talon-like nails at shadow. Their chanting changed. Obey your mother! Obey your mother! Shadow started making strange noises. I rushed forward. Her glossy fur changed to pale skin, which took on a greenish glow as she morphed into a beautiful young witch. She ran with her arms outstretched to her mother who remonstrated that perhaps now she would stop complaining about being a witch. I suddenly felt exposed, naked, six, six pairs of hypnotic bright green eyes stared at me. I felt a strange tingling sensation. My skin started to itch and my tongue felt rough. As I crept away, no one stopped me. My back ached, so I got on all fours. I followed her home. She turned and said, Where have you come from? Have you been following me? Her voice was so familiar. As she knelt and stroked me, I looked up into her hypnotic bright green eyes. <laughs> Maybe I was imagining it, but I very much doubt it. 
I could hear humming sounds, the creaking of the chair rocking slowly back and forth. I'd picture it in my mind, too terrified to peep over the cupboard. I would recite the Lord's <coughs> Prayer in my head and whisper the words, oh, please don't hurt me. Sometimes I would just cry myself to sleep, exhausted with fear, all over this ruddy dog. I know from childhood to adolescence to adulthood to this day, my uneasiness and ingrained psychological insecurities are all because of that doll. I have a fear of dolls, mannequins, clowns, anything you can like. I never really knew what happened to that doll except when we moved house back then in the 80s, I accidentally on purpose, between you and me, threw it into the incinerator in our garden. Dad was burning some rubbish he had collected that day. So I acted quickly and shoved it head first among the wastage. Up she went with roaring flames and clouds of ash smoke, mounting its evil presence, and it was no more. However, I can't be sure. <laughs> <laughs>
17 of them, shouted their conversation across her flat, usually over a crying baby <coughs> or a attention-seeking toddler. The teenagers of the family were quiet, sulky ones. Ethel had trouble remembering all their names and who belonged to who. It didn't matter. They were family and she was always glad of company. Ethel bent close over the glass case, as in the hoard pieces. She reached in her handbag again, her spectacles providing a little better sight. The gold pieces were fascinating. She stared and stared and stared. When she had soaked them up into her memory, she returned her glasses to the bag and turned to find the exit. More stairs, <coughs> this time spiralling downwards. One at a time, she told herself, gripping the handrail with her left hand and clutching her handbag and walking stick with the other. Her thick grey tweed coat felt heavy on her shoulder blades, but it kept the cold out. As she neared the bottom step, she became aware of a figure below her. She could smell something too. Who's there? She uttered, squinting her eyes, trying to make sense of the person clothed head to foot in black, a hood, a hood over his head. She gripped tighter to the handrail, her handbag and stick. He's going to rob me, she thought, her pension money newly acquired inside the old purse. Move aside, young man. Don't make me use this stick, she said, as loud as she could, with confidence. Her heart was pounding. She stepped another step nearer. His face, behind a curtain of black hair and a goatee beard, came into view. Pieces of metal glinted in the dim light. He had studs in his eyebrows, nose and cheek. She trembled. Move away, I said tears forming in her eyes with fear. He stubbed out his cigarette on the stone floor underneath his heavy black shiny boot. Yeah, he said. Oh no, there's a man. He's called a man. There's two of them. I'm done for. Ethel's stick released from her grip and clattered down the few remaining stone stairs. Oh no, they'll beat me with that. Damn it. The person bent to retrieve the stick I oh, got it now. Ethel looked to her left and to her right, but couldn't see a man. That voice, though, a twinge of recognition. Who are you? She stepped closer, even though she was scared. It's me, Nan. Jason. Her tense body relaxed a little. <coughs> Jason. Jason. Oh, Jason. He was reaching out his arm to her. Taking his hand to steady herself on the last step, she asked, What's that on your hand? It's a tat, Nan. <coughs> tat? What's that? A tattoo, Nan. Ethel now felt relief relaxing her muscles, but confusion flooded her mind. What are you doing here, Jason? I didn't know you smoked. It had a strange smell. I hope it wasn't drugs. No, oh, no. I told you, Tuesday. I'd meet you today. Did you forget? Aye, lad. Must have. How's your aspie? Aspie? Your pet, you said you'd got an aspie. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, not a pet. I'm an aspie. Asperger's. Ethel had no idea what Jason was on about. He led her to the exit and they began to walk down the slope. With each slow step, her anxieties melted away. Why are you wearing all black? Have you been to a funeral? And take that hood down, it's not raining. No, Nan, I'm a goth, I've told you before. An Aspie, with a tat, and a goth. Ethel was perplexed, but feeling safe on her grandson's arm. Or was it her great-grandson? She couldn't remember. But she knew in her heart. He wouldn't hurt a fly. <laughs>
the Victorian spirit. The little girl plays alone in her bedroom, immersed in a world of fantasy. She loves to draw scenes of the canal side and Victorian bridges which arch over the busy waterways. She listens to the thud of horses' hooves and the rasp of the ropes pulling the working canal boats. Timber and coal being carried aboard to the inner city areas. Her spirit belongs to those days gone by when the old Victorian canal side house was a thriving home for the mining community. Her father coming home covered from head to foot in coal dust. Nothing that writes coal, car, coal tar soap couldn't remove. Man constantly washing with baking soda and talcum powder. Vinegar and detergent also used to remove the soot and the coal dust. The wind would blow it away. A window slammed shut with a jolting, which startled a jolt. The little girl is suddenly drawn to the, back to the present day era. The air is thin. There was a chill in the breeze. The ice cold harbours no warmth. She can see her breath in the vapours of the air. Her heart beats fast as she remembers is the All Hallows' Eve dedicated to remembering the dead. She clings to the bed sheets, pulled over her head and feels a pressure on her legs, almost as if someone is sitting on the edge of the bed. She hears the sweet tones of the spirit child singing. I know an angel watches over me. God bless the angels and God bless me. The dulcet tones hang in the air, touching her heartstrings, lifting her soul. She feels the pressure from her legs on the, and the bed print springs pop. <coughs> then silence. Should she remove the bed sheets wrapped tightly around her head? Whilst thinking, her eyelids eye, eye grow heavy and she falls into a deep sleep to dream of the moon and the stars in her angelic slumberland. Was this a dream? Or was it a spirit drawing near to her in her mystical dreamscape? Who knows? Yeah. This is a poem about Maeve and Betty, a ghostly encounter. Trick or treat, Maeve? Aren't we a bit old for that? I'm not knocking on doors, I'm wearing all that tat. A party at the dog and dog? Oh, that's more like it, Maeve. But we're dressing up, you say? Oh, I don't think I'm that brave. Maeve said, don't be silly, we'll be in disguise. I will choose the outfits, it will be a nice surprise. Maeve dressed up as a witch, she looked seven feet tall. But I was a furry spider, I looked round and rather small. Maeve wore a, sh a short skirt, she looked so frivolous. But I had eight legs sticking out, I looked just ridiculous. Maeve crossed her shapely legs. She showed off all her thighs. I could have smashed her face in when she attracted all the guys. The monster mash was playing. Maeve danced across the floor. She moved with gay abandon as the men called out for more. I glared at her showing off. She looked so utterly fab. I hated my furry costume. 
I felt so very drab. I had a glass or two of punch. God knows what they put in it. But I had to keep my wits for me. She doesn't know her limits. There were goths and ghosts and monsters and ghouls, drinking and dancing and acting like fools. Maeve was dancing cheek to cheek with a skeleton that was very lean. On his face he wore a mask with a mouth that was a scream. Maeve didn't know who he was. She didn't even care. He was so light on his feet, but he had an unnerving stare. Maeve tried to step away from him, say adieu, farewell, because as the evening wore on, he had a pungent smell. I went to Maeve's rescue and tugged at his skinny arm. It fell off and rolled across the floor, which caused us great alarm. He stood and stared at us, Maeve hit him with her broom. Then as the clock chimed midnight, he floated out the room. We went screaming after him. But we both stood and dithered when we saw him morph into a snake and across the ground he slithered. He stuck his tongue out at us, then tried to crawl at Maeve's frock. She punched him on the head and he slithered under a rock. Oh, Maeve, you sure do pick em. I can't believe your look. I think we need a brandy back at the dog and dog. <laughs> <laughs>
Sue stifled her irritation and nodded towards the board as she sat down. I see Amy has died. Yes, replied Pauline. I'll expect you be round there offering comfort. At least you've the decency this time to wait until she's gone. I think I'll have the liver today. The onions help my constipation, you know. <laughs> Shall I be mother? She drew the two cups towards her and started pouring out the tea. So, stared sharply at Pauline. Will you mind you, Pauline, who'd come out with an accusation? Or had she? Maybe guilt is making her read too much into an innocent statement. Not that guilt had bothered her before. Age must be catching up with her. She definitely must slow down. Maybe give Gary Rogers' hospital visit a miss. Excuse me. The voice changed from polite stranger to local accident, accent, as the speaker recognised Sue. Oh, it's you. How are you doing? It's been ages since we met. Bella from the local bowling club stood before her. I was going to ask if I could borrow a chair so I could sit with my friends over there. She vaguely waved in the direction of the door. Good to see you. Yes, of course, replied Sue. Bella placed her hand on the chair and made no attempt to move it. Instead, she sat down and, leaning forward, placed her hand over Sue's. And looked at I was so sorry when I heard the news. I know that you two are close. What's the matter with everyone today, thought Sue. Do you mean Amy, she replied. I've been expecting it for some time. She never recovered from that fall, you know. Pauline butted into the conversation. Sorry, I must go to the toilet. That tea's gone straight through me. She heaved herself to her feet, using the table for support, and shuffled across the floor at surprising speed. Bella continued, as though the interruption had not happened. No, I mean your friend Pauline. It was such a shock when we heard that she died. Pauline? Pauline's fine. She was sitting here a minute ago. Didn't you see her? Bella looked puzzled, then concerned. Oh, I'm so sorry. Grief can do that to you. It's often hard to accept that you'll never see a loved one again. We were just saying that we think that's what happened to Pauline. Going through her husband's things and realising he wasn't going to be there anymore. No, you've got it wrong. My Paulie is alive and if you wait a few minutes, she'll be back from the toilet. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Whatever must you think of me? Uh, nice to see you looking so well. And Bella scuttled away, clutching the chair to her. When she reached her table, she started talking excitedly to her companions, who looked over to Sue. And then, at the board, Sue looked up. There against Pauline's name was a white lily. It certainly not been there when they came in. Someone's playing a game, she thought, and felt a deep anger rising up. The anger was still there when Pauline came back. Look, Pauline, look at the board. Some spiteful scumbag has put a white lily against your name. Yes, replied Pauline calmly. That's right. I died three days ago, but I didn't want to cancel our Saturday get-togethers. Shall we order now? What are you talking about? You're not dead. Oh, I am. Uh, I should know. I was a bit upset at the time, especially when I came across the letters you'd sent my Harry. I took a few extra tablets, the ones that Dr Freeman gave me to help me sleep. Well, they certainly worked. I'm okay now, and it's nice to know what really had been going on. I didn't fancy meeting up with Eric again, though. Maybe later. Also, I realised that I would miss our weekly trips to the shops and the cafe, so I decided to carry on doing that for a while. Please myself for a change. So I meet you every Saturday at the bus stop at 11. Try not to be late. <laughs> You wouldn't like me to come looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, I, mean, I found a, I sound a bit lazily, so that's the first thing. And I was really gutted to miss the uh, castle by candlelight last week. But anyway, I'm here now. The story is called The Haunting. You all know Sir Robert Peel, MP for Tamworth. But did you know, when younger, 
He was MP for Cashel, County Tipperary, in Ireland. I want to transport you across the sea to the island of his time, but the time of the Great Famine. You will hear screams of, you did nothing to save us, our potato crops failed, you stole our corn to feed others. Death came slowly and painfully. Against this background, like that of a banshee, one cry could be heard above the others. I will haunt you forever, Sir Thomas Palmer, aristocrat, cruel overlord, evictor of the poor, Irish scum you called us. This cry came from Roisin, a real beauty, but also a kind and unassuming woman, much loved by her community. Michael, who some would describe as rather a simpleton, adored her. She was so kind to him always. However, she was abused by Sir Thomas Palmer, who had visited her several times, forcing himself upon her, handing out a meagre amount of food in return. As on other occasions, she heard the thunder of hooves screeching to a halt on the barren earth. Her children scattered, no father to protect them. He stood before her, his ugly, leering face, his large frame casting a shadow. She knew what to expect, but this time she thought no more. With a huge effort and weak with hunger, she made a grab for a knife but was not fast enough. He wrenched it from her. There was a scream, followed by a deathly moan. He threw her limp body onto the sack bed on the floor. Ignoring his blood-splattered shirt, he dusted himself down and left. Her death shocked her whole community, people who were used to acts of barbarism, but this was something else. It was Michael who ventured into the cottage and was horrified at what he saw. She was buried in a shallow communal grave, a result of so many dying at once. But Roisin could not, would not rest in the peace that death normally brings. Thomas Palmer gave little thought to what he had done. Until one particularly warm night, he became very anxious and restless. There was a sudden stirring within the room. He looked to the end of the bed, opened his mouth to scream, but no sound came. She was there, a hazy figure, the sitting calmly on the end of his bed, her green eyes glowing in the dark. He could see the outline of a bandage around her neck, covered with congealed blood. She made a gesture across her throat, a stark warning to him. He was shaking now and went for a large drink. Sleep deprivation followed for many nights, wearing him down. His wife, Lady Jane, noticed how agitated he had become and even more morose. Had he been spurned by some woman? She was used to his dalliances over the years. Yet he did love her more than anyone or anything. He couldn't do without her. But riding back from friends in dim evening light, a ghostly figure crossed her path. Sensing this, the horse reared. She was thrown, neck broken. The cries of the banshee heard once more. Hearing the devastating news, Sir Thomas began a rapid decline. Drinking, hallucinating, wandering at night, his life became a nightmare. He saw demons. He saw the faces of those he had punished, evicted, and left to die. But always above others, he saw the face of Roisin. One night, he saw her again, as beautiful as the first night he'd set eyes upon her. She beckoned him towards the grain shed, normally securely locked. She seemed to pass through the door, and he followed. From nowhere, a small group of villagers arrived. They seemed almost driven by a force they had yet to understand. They were hungry and defeated people who had nothing to lose. And there he was, the vile, intoxicated individual who had made their lives hell. 
Michael heard a whispering. Go for it, now is your chance to avenge Roisin. The normally gentle, harmless Michael grabbed a knife and clearly, coolly and clinically cut the throat of this evil man. In his last moments of torment, it wasn't Roisin who Thomas saw, but demons beckoning him, leading him, and then oblivion. It was her final retribution. Heart-stopping violence turned to a peaceful silence. She was at rest. A small group of villagers took what they wanted in the way of food and calmly walked away, as Sir Thomas had done when he murdered Roisin. Grandma was in the lounge and didn't hear the knock at the front door as it was down the passage. But Cuddles, her dog, heard the noise and started to bark. She slowly made her way to the door and opened it. A man stood there. Charlie, have you got leave? You only joined the RAF three months ago. Goodness, why are you all wet? There's no rain. A small whine came from Cuddles. She looked down at him as he moved closer to her. Looking up again to kiss her son, she found there was no one there. Only a small pool of water where he stood. The telegram came two days later. It read, Charles Valentino Kelly, lost at sea in the, in the Mediterranean on a troop ship. We're all lost in sorrow and wonder. That was by Joe Kelly, that was my dad, and he was on behalf of my great uncle Charlie, who, um, I There's no other location, only this place. There's no space or place other than here. Yes, I know you think it's pure imagination on your part. Neither is there a future nor a past. Your only existence is now. This is a haunted universe. There's no other location, only this place. There's no space or place other than here. Yes, I know you think there is, but it's pure imagination on your part. Neither is there a future nor a past. Your only existence is now. This is a haunted universe. Rain lashes. Wind swells, sweeping across the courtyard. It's a wild thing. Take the path through the castle's inner chambers, but be still. Listen to his whispered secrets. You'll glimpse the horror of demonic forces surrounding you. This is a haunted universe. Rain lashes, wind swells and sweeps across the courtyard. It's a wild thing. Take the path through the castle's inner chambers, but be still. Listen to his whispered secrets. You'll glimpse the horror of demonic forces surrounding you. This is a haunted universe. Only those with courage or extreme curiosity will take the journey. When you do, you'll scream in terror as you freefall into the abyss. So, pause a while if you must before letting go, but only for a minimum delay. Too long and you'll turn to salt. This is a haunted universe. Only those with courage or extreme curiosity will take the journey. 
When you do, you'll scream in terror as you free fall into the abyss. So pause a while if you must before letting go, but only for a minimum of delay. Too long and you'll turn to salt. This is a haunted universe. There's no turning back now, so go on. All identity is torn away. You no longer exist. Only remnants of the person you once were remain. The terrible day and nightmare is over. Laughter will replace the ghostly demons who no longer entice you. You've arrived at the gateless gate. Passing through, you notice that it was always open. There's no turning back now, so go on. All identity is torn away. You no longer exist. Only remnants of the person you once were remain. The terrible day and nightmare is over. Laughter will replace the ghostly demons who no longer entice you. You've arrived at the gateless gates. Passing through, you notice it was always open. The journey of nine and a thousand years is over. Home, safe, in light and grandeur. Long green legs and a very, very long, long, long tongue. And when that tongue came out, he saw a fly, the tongue would come out and he'd catch the fly at the edge of the tongue and the fly would stick to the tongue and then the tongue would wrap itself up and he'd eat the fly. Delicious, absolutely delicious. Right? He was very good at jumping because he got stronger back legs and he would jump up high and come down again. And you'd think Freddy would be a happy frog, but he wasn't. He wasn't happy because he had no friends. He tried to have friends. He would go up to the other frogs and say, um, can I be your friend, can I be your friend? And they'd say, no, I don't want to be your friend, go away. And then he'd say, shall we play leapfrog? We can, we can do leapfrog over each other. And they'd say, stop wasting our time, go away. And then he'd say, if you be my friend, I'll let you have some of my flies. And they say, we can get our own flies. Go away. So he was a bit sad. And then one day, some of the frogs came to him and they said, Freddy, do you want to play hide and seek? And he said, oh, yes, yes, please. And he said, right, what you've got to do is you've got to put your hands over your eyes and count up to 100, and we've got to hide, and then you've got to find us. So he did, and he was, two, three, four, and he was very good, and then he started looking for the other frogs, and he searched, he searched under the stones, and he searched in the weeds, and he searched everywhere he could, and he couldn't find them. And then he heard them. They had all gone to the next pond, and they were hiding there. They were making a joke of him. They were saying, oh, look at that stupid Freddy. Oh, look at him. <laughs> and Freddy heard them. And he was so sad. He jumped out of the pond. And he jumped onto the stove. And he started to cry. <laughs> and the stone said, Do you mind? Freddy jumped off the stone and looked out. You don't usually expect stones to talk to you. And he found out it wasn't a stone. It was a tortoise. And so he said, Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Tortoise. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to do that. And he said, Why are you crying? Tortoises talk like that. They're very, very slow. Right. And Freddy said, I'm crying because, because you're not going to cry. And the tortoise said, Do you mind repeating? 
did not. I didn't understand. I thought I said slowly let me know. I'm crying because I Tortoises go to sleep in the winter. So he came up out of the pond and he went for his friend Mr. Tortoise. And Mr. Tortoise didn't come. And the next day, Freddy came out of the pond and he went for his friend Mr. Tortoise. And he didn't come. And that's what it went on for a week. And then Freddy thought, Mr. Tortoise doesn't want to be my friend anymore. Nobody wants to be my friend. I don't know what I did wrong. But I haven't got any friends again. And he went back into the pond. Now into the pond there came a pike. A pike with a fish that's got very, very strong teeth. And now it's tearing very fish to pieces. And the pike came into the pond and all the frogs saw him and they hid away and they were so scared. All except Freddy. Freddy didn't know about this. He didn't know he was supposed to be cared, scared about pikes because nobody had bothered to tell him. So mm -hmm. Freddy went on swimming around in the pond and the pike came around and he thought, Ah, ah, I've got a little frog here. Ah, I can have fun with him. I will chase him. And then when he gets away, I will go and bite one of his legs off. And then I'll bite the other leg off. And then I'll bite his other leg off. And then I'll take his head off. And then I'll have a good fun. So he swam up to Freddy. <coughs> but Freddy kept on swimming. And the pike was a bit worried about this. And he said, Why are you not scared of me? <clears throat> Freddy said, why should I be? And the pike said, because I'm going to eat you. Slimly. <laughs> and Freddy said, oh no, you're not. And he turned on his side, and he lifted up one of his legs, his strong legs, and he kicked out, and he hit the pike on the nose. Now, of course, Frog hitting a pike is not going to really kill the pike. But the pike was thinking to himself, if this little frog will do that, what will the other frogs do? I better get out of here. So he swam around and he disappeared out of the pond. And all the other frogs saw him go. And after a while, when he came, 
big grey bat and it came out from under the stones and the weeds. And then they said, did you see that? Did you see what that frog did? Did you see what he did? He went and hit that pipe on the nose. And then they started coming round to him and they said, aren't you brave? Aren't you clever? And then one of the frogs said to Freddie, Freddie, would you be my friend? And then another frog said, oh, Freddie, would, would you be my friend as well? And then soon all the frogs would say, Freddie, would you be my friend? What do you think Freddie said? Did he say, go away, I don't want anything to do with you? Or did he say, yes? <laughs> yeah, he said, yes. And all the frogs jumped around and they were happy. And then one of the frogs came up to Freddie and said, Freddie, you're so brave and you're so clever. Would you like to be our king? <gasps> king, King Freddie the Frog. Oh, how fantastic. And he just nodded his head. He couldn't say anything. He just nodded his head. So they got a crown and they put it on his head and they gave him a cloak. And now Freddie had loads of frogs to play with. And he thinking he had it. In the back of his head, he started thinking about his friend Mr. Tortoise. And where was it? Well, the winter passed and the spring came. And the tortoise was in his, in his cage. And he suddenly opened his eyes and thought, Oh, I feel a lot warmer now. Oh, I think I'll go down to the pond. We ambled down to the pond. And there was Freddy. And he said, Hello, Freddy. I've had a nice sleep. And Freddy turned around and said, Oh, oh this is Tortoise, you're back. And the Tortoise said, Yeah, what, what's been happening? So Freddy told him about the pies and he told him about how he was now the king and how he had lots of friends. And the Tortoise said, Oh, well, if you've got so many friends, you won't want to be my friend, then will you? And Grace looked at the tortoise and he says, You were my first friend. You are my best friend. And you will always be my friend. <laughs> so every day, in the morning, Freddy's in the pond and he's being the king. But in the afternoon, he goes out to the pond and he sits by the side of the pond and he talks to the tortoise and they talk about grass and they talk about <coughs> flies and they talk about the important things of life. And Freddy is not lonely anymore. <laughs> well. Those were some very talented performers, I have to say. And I hope you all had a very lovely time watching them. And that you enjoyed their videos. And so, after Tamworth Castle once again got right spooky, I just wish to say, it was lovely having you here. <laughs>